102 miles an hour. Unheard of in 2014. Possibly the highest VLR prep prospect that ever displayed at the time. This is the story of the infamous Tyler Kolick. But first, let's play that intro. Hey guys, it's Brett here with Baseball Prospect Analysis, and today we're going to talk about Tyler Kolick. Kolick was truly a one-of-a-kind player back in 2014. No other prospects were quite like him. Kolick was a monstrous 6'5", 250-pound right-handed pitcher from the small farm town of Shepard, Texas. The class of 2014 prospect was known for being a true fireballer, often sitting in the upper 90s with the ability to surpass triple digits, which in 2014 was unheard of. Many scouts and fans alike argued he may be the hardest throwing prep prospect ever with reports of him touching 102 multiple times. Now in 2021, it seems every year there are one or two 18 year olds touching triple digits, which is nuts. It really does show you how much youth training has improved in the past decade. Unfortunately, like many power pitchers, Tyler was much more of a flamethrower rather than a true pitcher, heavily relying on the flames and smoke to blow it by prep opponents, but lacking in many other categories. Tyler had a slider with plus-plus potential movement-wise, but struggled to locate it. An average 12-6 curveball that he would alter his mechanics to throw, and a complete lack of a changeup. Mechanically, many scouts agreed he could use some adjusting, but he wasn't atrocious by any means. Despite these concerns, Kolick put together a senior campaign that could only be described as phenomenal, delivering a final stat line of 126 strikeouts, only 8 walks, and a 0.35 ERA in 60.1 innings pitched. On paper, this made it seem as though control and command were no issue whatsoever, and the performance certainly cemented him in as a first-round draft pick. The potential benefits of drafting Kolick far outweighed the risks now in some organizations' eyes. Fast forward to June, and sure enough, with the second overall pick, the Miami Marlins secured the Texas flamethrower with a whopping $6 million signing bonus. The Marlins organization had just come off an atrocious 2013 season, finishing last in the NL East with a 62-100 and record, the second-worst record in the MLB behind the Astros' 51-111. and But this is what the Marlins wanted. They purposely tanked their 2013 season in order to gain some high-quality prospects for the future. Well, at least that's what seemed to be their plan initially. The D. Gordon trade, which was executed in December of 2014, would send a number of Marlins prospects, including Andrew Heaney, a highly sought-after left-handed pitcher to the Dodgers, effectively leaving the Marlins system somewhat bare with only Tyler Kolick and J.T. Romildo as a notable few. Funnily enough, the Marlins went back to their original strategy in 2017 by trading Gordon for three prospects from Seattle, two of which were in the top seven of the Mariners' prospects. Well, now you have a little background on the situation, you can understand the Marlins' expectations for Kolick. They understood he had an adult body and didn't project at all. He was maxed out in every way physically and velocity-wise at the young age of 18, but they clearly believed they could take that adult body, lean it out a bit, and clean up his mechanics. Pitch-wise, it was clear he was a fastball slider guy who needed to develop a changeup. Very few MLB pitchers can get away with three, let alone two pitches, and the ones that can are primarily relievers who have impeccable stuff with both pitches. These guys also make it near impossible to tell which pitch is coming, as their arm and the ball itself tend to stay on the same plane and tunnel in the same fashion for both pitches, well at least until the last second. Kolick was never drafted to be a two-pitch flamethrowing reliever. His fastball didn't move enough to make up for his lack of command, and his slider was always inconsistent, and a pitcher drafted number two overall is almost never going to start out as a reliever. The Marlins planned to refine Kolick instead of develop and were risking a whole season's worth of tanking on a hope that Kolick could turn into an inning-eating, flame-throwing machine that even Nolan Ryan predicted he would be. Mr. Nolan Ryan, let me just say, I love you. love how you played the game. You are a huge inspiration to me growing up. But this, this was an awful prediction, based on hype and inflated high school stats. I will say, though, back in 2014, I absolutely bought into the hype. But I was only a sophomore in high school and fully believed Velo was not just king, but the only thing that mattered. Insert my high school walk rate. Okay, so I know I sounded a bit harsh in the last segment, but none of that was directly aimed at Tyler. He's just a kid with traditional family values who happens to be in the situation. And maybe it's a fact that most major scouting organizations and MLB teams have witnessed what happens to these types of pitchers in the recent decade at least. But I still don't feel bad for the Marlins at all. I certainly feel bad for Tyler, but I feel as though Miami handled this prospect 
horrifically. So now let's get into his infamously bad pro career. Starting in 2014, Kolek was sent to rookie ball in the Gulf Coast League. Like many prep pitchers, his first year in pro ball was short and pitch count oriented. He would finish the year 0-3 with a 4.5 ERA and 22 innings pitched. Couple that with 18 strikeouts and 13 walks, and makes for a below average first season. However, just like many other prospects in their first year, the sample size is small and numbers aren't generally a big concern. Jump ahead to 2015, he turned in another year of struggles. Ranked as the 46th best prospect in the minors, he was given 25 games started and a total of 108.2 innings. This would be the largest workload of his pro career. Clearly, the Marlins wanted to give him as much in-game action as possible to help him develop and adjust to single-A competition. Unfortunately, this resulted in a 4-10 record with a 4.56 ERA and 81 strikeouts to 61 walks. Add in the 13 hit batters and it's more like an 81-74 to ratio. His meal ticket triple-digit fastball was now settling in the low to mid-90s range more often than not, and the rest of his arsenal was severely lacking. As ESPN's Keith Law put it, Kolek doesn't have command of either of his pitches well. His changeup is in its infancy. I don't think he's a fast mover given how much work there is to do. But there are a few prospects anywhere in the minors who look more like a frontline starter than Kolek does. So there was still hope for the future, but Kolek's lack of pitchability has started to show its true colors. The work that needed to be done was clear, but the timeline was much more blurry. How long would it take to polish Kolek's many shortcomings? Heading into the 2016 season, Kolek was now ranked the 97th best overall prospect by ESPN, falling a staggering 51 spots compared to 2015. For many analysts, Kolek just had too many raw spots to even crack their top 100. The deciding factor for many was that his triple-digit fastball now had to drop to as low as the high 80s range in order for him to throw strikes. And just as he thought things could get much worse for the poor kid, disaster struck. On April 6, 2016, Tyler had gone under the knife for UCL reconstruction, or more commonly known as Tommy John surgery. For a prospect that needed as much mound work as Kolek did, this surgery seemed to be a nightmare happening in real life. Now he would have to wait anywhere from 12 to 24 months to be 100% again. And that's truly the last thing he needed timeline-wise regarding his development. But maybe this time off would give his trainers and himself more time to look at film and really hone in his mental approach of pitching. And another thing to mention is Tyler was still much younger than his competition at this point. Three years younger on average, so despite the delay, he still had time. Fifteen months later, Kolek would make his return, appearing again in the Gulf Coast Rookie League. Unfortunately, the results were, well, simply put, awful. In 3.2 innings of work, Tyler faced 31 batters. Yes, you heard that right. 31 batters. And of those 31, he either walked or plunked 17 of them. Clearly, he was not ready. And he ended up being placed in the DL for another 12 months. And let me say from personal experience, coming back from TJ and having an immediate bad outing or two is a huge confidence killer. Even if physically he was ready to pitch and just not producing, pulling him for the year was definitely the right move. Coming back from UCL surgery is certainly a physical challenge, but it's even tougher mentally, and having an outing like that on your comeback debut could kill your confidence for months. Approaching the 2018 season, Kolek, the former number one ranked Marlins prospect, was now in slot number 28 in the organization via MLB Pipeline. But just like years past, one solid season of production could turn that number 28 into another number 28. Number 28 overall, rather than in the Marlins system itself. But he would certainly need to prove himself for this to happen. Once again, he started in the rookie Gulf Coast League on July 18th, turning in one average and one awful appearance. They then promoted him to the single-A Batavia Muck Dogs. They already appeared in eight relief situations, gathering up a total of 14 innings. He allowed 12 hits, 7 earned runs, and only 7 walks. Add on the 12 strikeouts, and you get a 1-2 and two finish with a 4.5 ERA. This stat line was by no means impressive, especially with the lack of innings pitched. But for Tyler, I would have viewed it as a stepping stone. It certainly could have gone better, but for Kolek, it also could have gone a lot worse. After the season, he was Rule 5, meaning he was eligible for other teams to draft him in the Rule 5 draft since the Marlins did not add him to their 40-man roster. However, no teams picked him up, and the Marlins certainly had too much invested to give up on him at this point. Fast forward to 2019, and things just didn't seem to click for Kolek. He split time between short A ball and full season single A ball, being used solely as a reliever. The results were just not good, not good at all, totaling 13.2 innings pitched, 14 earned runs, and a heart-dropping 27 walks, over 2 walks per inning. All in all, he was 0-1 with a 9.22 ERA. The 
only positive was that he struck out 20 as well as kept opposing batters to a .167 batting average. That being said, it's hard to hit the ball when it's never in the strike zone. With little to no information available on Kolek following the season, you have to wonder if this was the last straw for Miami. Like many other minor leaguers, Kolek did not play in 2020 due to the lack of a season. And his bullpen and training results must have been underwhelming, given that on November 2nd of 2020, Kolek became a minor league free agent. As of March 2021, Tyler's not been signed to any MLB team for spring training or for the 2021 minor league season. And I would not be shocked if that stays true for quite a while. MLB organizations have cut ties with more than 40 affiliate clubs across the country this year, so there is even less roster space for projects like Kolick. It's unfortunate, but realistic. There are lots of younger, more projectable prospects throwing mid-90s in today's farm systems. Okay, so I know it's been a long one today, guys, so I'm going to try and do my best to keep this conclusion short as possible with the insight I'd like to provide. First off, Kolick would not be drafted nearly as high in today's MLB drafts. Don't believe me? 19-year-old left-handed fireballer Luke Whittle touches 105 and sat 100 plus for a bullpen shortly before the 2020 draft. When was he taken? He was picked up by the Cubs with the 117th pick with a $492,000 signing bonus. My point is MLB organizations have learned their lesson. Velocity is still important, but so many other factors come into play when scouting prospects in 2021. All right, now let's get to Kolick. Tyler should have never been drafted as a starting pitcher. His high school stats were inflated due to lack of competition, and over time you'd realize his adult frame was misleading. He was not the classic big inning-eating workhorse that just happened to throw heat. He was a big kid who utilized his body weight and momentum to throw some serious cheese, though. The issue with these types of pitchers is the lack of command and consistency in general. A tall and fall guy will be able to repeat his mechanics much easier, in my opinion, even though I'm a huge fan and supporter of kinetic chain-based pitching instruction. The more lean, muscular, and athletic guys tend to do extremely well with this type of pitching. Kolick, despite his hulking size, was certainly proficient at this, at least velocity-wise, in high school. But due to his lack of command, he'd make a much better short relief guy or possibly a closer in MLB. Despite this, the Marlins insisted he trained to become a frontline starter one day. And one of the major things they did with him was try to simplify and calm his mechanics. I truly believe this was detrimental for his development. Sure, his control and command were not great, but they seemed to only get worse as the years went on with all the tweaking they did. ParksPerformance.net wrote a great analysis of the changes over the years. Most notably, his tempo was much slower, his front leg strutted much more open, and his body momentum towards the plate was drastically slower. You have to remember, the arm itself doesn't throw 100 miles an hour. The body creates the power and acceleration for the arm to have an opportunity to cycle through at an elite rate of arm speed. And all the mechanical changes they implemented took away from Kolek's arm's opportunity to create that triple-digit speed again. Obviously, this is just my personal opinion and it should be taken with a grain of salt. We also can't blame the Marlins for Kolek's injuries. To summarize it all, I believe Kolek was about four years before his time, put in a bad situation that didn't seem to have a light at the end of the tunnel. The unreal expectations that were indirectly placed on him due to the tanked seasons and trades that didn't help either. At the end of the day, I don't think we will ever see Kolek in an MLB jersey or maybe even in a minor league one ever again. If he decides to keep that dream alive, I'm sure there are some independent or overseas teams that would love to have him. If you guys were able to make it to the end, I'd like to thank you for sticking around with us and hearing the story. I'd really appreciate it if you guys could toss a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. I'd love to have 100 subscribers before May 1st. These story style videos often take hours of research, script work, and editing, and I do it all myself. I really enjoy it and would love to do it for a living one day, so any support helps. Have a great rest of your day, guys, and enjoy some spring baseball.